Hello, friends. You know what you're watching. You're watching 3ABN Sabbath School panel. And as always, we're thankful that you're taking the time out of your busy day to join us during this Sabbath School study time because we're making our way through, as we said, our lesson on managing for the master till he comes. And this has, I don't know about you guys, this has been an incredible lesson. Uh, you know, you would think looking at a su subject like this, it'd be focused on tithe and offering and some things that maybe some people may not be interested in. But this has actually been an incredible lesson and has just uh, surprised me a lot. And I don't say that in a negative way. I say just it's a wonderful thing. So praise God. Uh, this week we're on lesson number 11 entitled Managing in tough times. And, uh, and we're going to go ahead and introduce our panel members at this time. If you don't know them, someone may be watching for the first time and they want to know who this lady is to my left, Miss Jill Morricone. It's <laughs> always a blessing to have you, sister. Thank you, Ryan. Glad to be here. On Monday, we look at trust God, not your own resources. Awesome. Okay. And to your left is Pastor John Dinsey. It's a blessing to be here as well. Tuesday is what I have and it's entitled Time to Simplify. All right, praise the Lord. And of course, next to you is Miss Shelley Quinn. Always a joy. Um, my lesson for Wednesday is priorities, which is very important in times of trouble. All right, and of course, last but not least, Pastor John Loma King. Always a blessing yes. to have you, brother. Mine is entitled, When No One Can Buy or Sell. We're diving into Daniel Ooh. and Revelation. All right. I'm looking forward to that. All right, looking forward to that, yeah. All right, my friends. Well, I'm going to read our memory text and then we're going to have a prayer. Memory text today comes from Psalm chapter 50, verses 14 and 15, reading from the New King James Version. It says, Offer to God thanksgiving and pay your vows to the Most High. Call upon me in the day of trouble. I will deliver you and you shall glorify me. Powerful text. And I'm going to ask Michelle Quinn if you wouldn't mind having an opening prayer for us. Absolutely. Heavenly Father, we come before you and we thank you, Lord, that you are our shield and our exceedingly great reward. We love you and we ask right now that your Holy Spirit would come, be our teacher, anoint our lips, anoint our ears and help us to put into practice all that we learn in Jesus' name. Amen. Mm. Amen. Amen. Sabbath afternoon's lesson brings out and says, sometimes our world seems to be spinning out of control. Isn't that the truth? <laughs> Wars, bloodshed, crime, immorality, natural disasters, pandemics, economic uncertainty, political corruption, and more. There is a strong urge for individuals and families to think first of their own survival. Accordingly, much thought is given to seeking security in these uncertain times, which of course is understandable. The toils of life do take a lot of our daily focus. With debts to pay, children to raise, property to maintain, it does take time and thought. And of course, we do need clothes and food and shelter. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus addressed, addresses these basic needs and then stated in Matthew chapter 6, verses 32 and 33, He says, Your heavenly Father knows what, uh, that you need all of these things, but seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. And of course, amid trying times, when we need to lean on the Lord more than ever, there are some concrete steps based on biblical principles that we should follow. And that basically launches us into Sunday's lesson where we're going to be putting God first. That's the title of Sunday's lesson, putting God first. I think that's the number one thing we need to focus on as we're going down to today's uh, each individual day and we're learning how to manage in tough times. My friends, one of the worst mistakes that you could ever make is seek self first. Mm. Uh, many people do that. And of course, it doesn't go over well for them. God is waiting for you earnestly to put him first. And we learned some lessons from a, a powerful story I've read many times found in 2 Chronicles chapter 20, verses 1 through 22. Uh, I hope we have time to read this entire passage, but there are so many great lessons that we can learn from a very difficult and trying time that the children of Israel were going through under King Jehoshaphat. And of course, this finds, again, it finds us again in 2 Chronicles chapter 20, verses 1 through 22. Let's go there. We'll begin reading and then we'll learn and pick apart this and, and bring about some lessons that we can learn through this along the way. I'm in verse 1 of 2 Chronicles chapter 20. 
And it says, it happened after this that the people of Moab with the people of Ammon and others with them besides the Ammonites came to battle against Jehoshaphat. Then some came and told Jehoshaphat saying, a great multitude is coming against you from beyond the sea from Syria and they are in Hazazon Temar, which is in Gedi. And Jehoshaphat feared and set himself to seek the Lord and proclaimed a fast throughout all Judah. So Judah gathered together to ask help from the Lord. And from all the cities of Judah, they came to seek the Lord. It is true that when you start seeking the Lord, when you start living for God, it stirs up the enemy. And he will do everything he can in bringing all of your enemies against you. That's exactly what was happening here to Jehoshaphat as he was called as a king after Ahab. He was the, he was the one that came in after perhaps maybe the worst of all of the kings. He had to clean up what had happened in Israel. He tore down all of the high places. He tore down all of the altars of Baal and he was trying to restore God or doing his part to restore uh, the, the commandments of the Lord and the work of God in Israel. And uh, in this case, the enemy brought his enemies against him. And so he proclaimed a fast throughout all Jerusalem and throughout all the people there. They gathered together and they sought the Lord together. And this brings us to our first point. Don't make God your second, third, or last plan. Put him first. Okay, that's the title of the lesson, right? Put him first. Many times when we find ourselves in a trial or we find ourselves in a difficult situation, the first thing for us to do is to kick into panic mode and start figuring out what we're going to do, how we're going to aid or, or, or fix this problem ourselves. When in reality, the first thing we should do is say, Lord... <laughs> I don't know what I'm doing and I don't trust myself to do what is right in this situation. Can you come and help me, Lord? Can you be there for me? And that's exactly what happened. In this case, you know, we know that we are not wrestling against flesh or blood, as Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12 says, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts and wickedness in heavenly places. So the enemy will do everything he can to wage a war against you, to separate you from God, to keep you down, to keep you discouraged, and of course, ultimately to sever you from the Lord. But of course, you know, when those times come upon us, we can learn from Jehoshaphat and the people of Israel here. What did they do? Not, not only did they come to the Lord and say, oh, God, help us, but they actually proclaimed a fast. They humbled themselves in the presence of their Lord. And this reminds me of Luke chapter 5, verses 33 to 35, where Jesus you know, was being questioned by the disciples because they, they came to Jesus, and, or excuse me, not the disciples, but the Pharisees, and they came to Jesus and the disciples and said, well, what are you doing here? You're, you, you know, the disciples of John the Baptist, they fast, and, but you're disciples. Bibles, they just eat and drink and, and you don't say anything to them. And Jesus said to them, can you make the friends of the bridegroom fast while the bridegroom is with them? Uh, he says, but the days will come when the bridegroom will be taken away from them. Then they will fast in those days. My friends, the enemy, the, the spirit of God is being withdrawn from this planet daily. And we will find ourselves in deeper and deeper spiritual warfare in which there will come times when we will indeed have to humble ourselves in God's presence and we will have to fast and call, up on, call out on the Lord that we might be be delivered from our enemies. We continue in our story, verse 5 of 2 Chronicles chapter 20. It says, Then Jehoshaphat stood in the assembly of Judah and Jerusalem, in the house of the Lord before the new court, and said, O Lord God of our fathers, are you not God in heaven? And do you not rule over the kingdoms of the nations? And in your hand is there not power and might, so that no one is able to withstand you? He says, are you not our God who drove out the inhabitants of the land before your, before your people Israel and gave it to the descendants of Abraham, your friend, forever? Notice how he's bringing up Abraham. He's reminding God of the promise he made to his people. Right. And they dwelt in it and have built you a sanctuary in it for your name, saying, if disaster comes upon us, sword, judgment, pestilence, or famine, we will stand before this temple and in your presence, for your name is in this temple, and cry out to you in our affliction, and you will hear and save. And now here are your people, or excuse me, here are the people of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir, or Seir whom you would not let Israel invade when they came out of the land of Egypt, but they turned from them and did not destroy them. Here they are rewarding us by coming to throw us out of your possessed, or possession, which you gave us uh, to inherit. And then in verse 12, O our God, will you not judge them? 
For we have no power against this great multitude that is coming against us, nor do we know what to do, but our eyes are upon you. I love this. You know what? Point number two here I just want to bring out as we're, there's a lot of lessons we can glean from this big section we read. But when you pray, learn how to pray like your life depends on it. That's important. Each and every day, you know what? Our life does depend on it. Our life depends on him. And of course, when you pray, here's a powerful lesson. Pray the promises of God. That's right. Remind God, not that God needs reminding, but remind God that you know that he has, he has blessed you and has proclaimed promises over you. And that's exactly what Jehoshaphat was doing here as he's calling out on the Lord saying, Lord, you're the almighty. You're the powerful one. You gave us this land. We are the descendants of Abraham. You promised Abraham's descendants this land. And now our enemies are coming against us. God, we're depending on you to deliver us from this situation. And that's exactly what ends up happening. It goes on to say uh, in Samuel chapter, and I just read this right here, Samuel, 2 Samuel chapter 7 verse 25 just reminds us that it's okay to remind God of his promises because even in 2 Samuel chapter 7 verse 25 David says now O Lord God the word which you have spoken concerning your servant and concerning this house establish it forever and do as you have said I love that just reminding God that we know your word Lord and we're going to hold you to your word and he says all right I'm there for you uh, point number three here and I just want to read verse 13 before I go to point number three notice what verse 13 says in 2 Chronicles 20 it says, now all of Judah with their little ones, their wives and their children stood before the Lord. Point number three, this is crucial. God wants a united front. Yeah. God wants a united front. He wants unity in faith. It, you know what? It, it's, God does hear the prayers of the faithful few, but oh, how much more powerful it is when God's people are united together, coming together in times of need, in times where we're praying for each other and we're there for each other and we present ourselves united before the Lord. That's a very, very powerful point. Even Nineveh, this reminded me of Nineveh, when God proclaimed a judgment against them, every single person, man, woman, and child, they prayed with sackcloth and ashes and they humbled themselves before God united as a people and God saved them. Let's continue on to verse 14. Then the spirit of the Lord came upon Jeha Jehaziel, the son of Zechariah, the son of Benaniah. And it goes on down here, verse 15. And he said, listen, all you of Judah and you inhabitants of Jerusalem and you King Jehoshaphat, thus says the Lord to you. I only just, I made a point here that when we pray according to his will, God hears and will answer. God does hear your prayer and he will answer if you pray according to his will. And you could read 1 John chapter 5, verses 14 and 15 for that. But then uh, down here, point number five, I make stop attempting to defeat the enemy on your own. It's not your fight. Mm -hmm. I love this because if you read and we don't have time to finish reading all of this, but if you read on through here all the way down to verse 19, uh, the prophet brings about and says, you know what? God has told you this isn't your fight. You just you position yourselves. He says, there's a there's a nice sermon title. Position yourselves. He says, position yourselves, stand and watch the Lord do what he's going to do for you in this day and delivering you. And of course, point number six, learning to respond to God's goodness with thanksgiving and praise. When God did show up and he did deliver them, they sung praises to his name. They, they recognized and humbled themselves in recognizing that God was there for them because, and it all comes down to this, they put him first. Amen. That's the lesson to be learned from Sunday's lesson. Putting God first is essential if we're going to manage and make it through these difficult and trying times. Amen. Thank you so much, Ryan. What a powerful lesson. That is a king who was in trouble, but who sought the Lord. My lesson is a king who was not in so much trouble, but he did not seek the Lord and it did not turn out well. We're going to First Chronicles. First of all, my name is Jill Morricone. <laughs> On Monday's lesson, we look at trust God, not your own resources. And we study the story of a king. This is King David who did not trust God. He trusted his own resources. We're going to first Chronicles chapter 21. First Chronicles 21. And this is the story of David's numbering of Israel. And thank you, Shelley, for the lesson assignment. Shelley always coordinates the lesson assignments for us. And this one was one I've, I've read many times, but hadn't studied in depth. So thank you for that. We're looking at eight takeaways from David's numbering of Israel or eight lessons that we can learn today. We're in 1 Chronicles 21. Hopefully we're going to get through this whole passage, verses 1 through 14. Verse 1, now Satan stood up against Israel and moved David to number Israel. Takeaway number one, be careful when you allow Satan to influence your decisions. 
it wasn't God who was influencing David to number Israel. It was Satan who came in with that mm -hmm. uh, temptation to number Israel, to not trust God, but to trust his own resources. Be careful when you allow Satan to influence those decisions, especially when you're in leadership like David was. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, we've quoted this proverb many times on the set this last quarter, but it's worth repeating again. Trust in the Lord. Don't trust in yourself. Don't trust in man. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he will direct your paths. Look to God for guidance. As Jehoshaphat said, our eyes are upon you. Look to God for guidance, not yeah. self, and certainly not Satan. Let's go to verse 2. So David said to Joab, that's his general of the armies, David said to Joab and the leaders of the people, go, number Israel from Beersheba to Dan and bring the number of them to me that I may know it. Now David's giving a command that's uh, showcasing he's not trusting God. He's also giving a command that was directly prompted by the enemy. Wow. Verse 3, Joab answered, May the Lord make his people a hundred times more than they are. But my Lord the king, are they not all my Lord's servants? Why then does my Lord require this thing? Why should this be a cause of guilt in Israel? Mm -hmm. So Joab is remonstrating with the king saying, Really? Are you serious? You want me to go number Israel? Take away number two. Be careful when trusting in men and numbers right. instead of trusting in God. Joseph, uh, Joseph, David, David chose to trust in his men. He chose to trust in the military might of Israel instead of relying on God for protection. Psalm 20, verse 7 some trust in chariots and some in horses, but we, we will remember the name of the Lord our God. We will trust in God. The next verse, verse 4. Nevertheless, remember Joab has just told the king, are you serious? Do you really want me to do this? Nevertheless, the king's word prevailed against Joab. Therefore, Joab departed and he went throughout all Israel and came to Jerusalem. Takeaway number three, be careful when you think you know better than other people. David went against godly counsel. He went against the counsel of his men. He went in direct opposition to what God had wanted. I remember I had a boss once, and um, I remember one day him slamming his fist on the table, and he said, I don't pay you to think. I pay you to do what I say. Mm. That's kind of what David's doing here. Joab, I don't care what you think. Joab, I don't care that you're against this. I don't even care if I'm going against God. You're going to do what I say. So Joab went out and did what the king said. Be careful when you think you know better than other people. When he numbered Israel, he numbered all the men of military age, the men who could draw a sword. According to 2 Samuel 24, this story is also recorded in 2 Samuel 24, it took nine months for the numbering of the children of Israel. That's a lot of time. That's a lot of resources involved. That's right. The number that we are giving here in this account in 1 Chronicles is 1.1 million men. And Judah had 470,000 men. Now, it says the Bible's clear it did not include the tribes of Levi and Benjamin. Why is that? Both tribes were exempted because they were connected with Israel's sanctuary. The Levites were exempted, we know, from mandatory military service as they guarded the temple and they maintained public worship. And also in Benjamin, there was a tabernacle located in the city of Gibeon. So probably they had the same exemption as the Levites. We're going on to verse 7, 1 Chronicles 21, verse 7. God was displeased with this thing. Therefore, he struck Israel. So it took nine months for this numbering to take place. Joab comes back to Jerusalem, but God's displeased because David had gone against the Lord. Takeaway four, be careful of the consequences of disobedience. David was going to reap the consequences of his decision, but not just David. Israel was going to reap the consequences of the leader's decision. Galatians 6, verse 7, it says, Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. Whatever man sows, that will he also reap. 
Yes, there is repentance. Yes, there is forgiveness. Yes, there is restoration, but we still see, you see it time and time again throughout the Word of God, the law of cause and effect, the law of sowing and reaping, and that those consequences, even though there's forgiveness, yes, but those consequences many times we see still remain. Let's look at verse 8, 1 Chronicles 21, 8. And David said to God, I have sinned greatly. Here he's repenting because I've done this thing. But now I pray, take away the iniquity of your servant for I have done very foolishly. He says, God, I'm sorry. Now I realize, I recognize that I messed up. Take away five. Be willing to confess your sin. Be willing to return to God. You know, David sinned great, greatly in his uh, tenure as a king, but yet he repented. He sinned with the numbering of Israel. He also sinned with the situation with Bathsheba, but yet he repented and God later called him a man after his own heart. We see his willingness to confess his sins and his willingness to return to God. First on one nine, if we confess, he's faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now we see Gad, which is David's longtime friend and prophet come to David. We're in verse nine. The Lord spoke to Gad, and this is David's seer saying, go and tell David, saying, thus says the Lord, I offer you three things. So God gave David a choice as to the consequence he was going to have. I offer you three things. Choose one of them for yourself, that I may do it to you. So Gad came to David and said to him, thus says the Lord, choose for yourself. Verse 12, here's the three things. Either three years of famine or three months to be defeated by your foes with the sword of your enemies overtaking you, or else for three days the sword of the Lord, the plague in the land, with the angel of the Lord destroying throughout all the territory of Israel. Now consider what answer I should take back to him who sent me. Takeaway number six, be willing to accept the consequences of your sin. None of these things were pleasant. In fact, it's interesting, all three of the consequences mentioned here are mentioned in the curses in Deuteronomy chapter 28. You know, the law of blessing and cursing, you can look that up. All three of those were mentioned. Be willing to accept the consequences of your sin. Now in verse 13, David makes his decision. And David said to Gad, I'm in great distress, do not let me fall. And please let me fall into the hand of the Lord for his mercies are very great, but do not let me fall into the hand of men. Takeaway number seven, be willing to trust God even in difficulty. David's in great distress. He recognizes that he has sinned. He has repented, but he still recognizes there are consequences to that sin. And yet in the midst of his trouble, in the midst of his difficulty, He's choosing to trust God. He's saying, as it were, as Jehoshaphat said, our eyes are upon you. Even though I made a mistake, I am still trusting you in the midst of this difficulty. Finally, verse 14, the Lord sent a plague because David had made his choice. I'd rather fall into the hand of the Lord. The Lord sent a plague upon Israel and 70,000 men of Israel fell. Final takeaway number eight, be careful because your sin can affect others. 70,000 innocent men died because of one man's mistake. Mm. Yes, there is forgiveness. Yes, there is repentance, but there are still consequences to sin. Mm. Wow, thank you so much, Jill, for that powerful lesson. All right, my friends, we're going to take a short break. Don't go anywhere. We'll be right back. Ever wish you could watch a 3 ABN Sabbath School panel again? Or share it on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter? Well, you can by visiting 3ABNSabbathSchoolPanel.com. A clean design makes it easy to find the program you're looking for. There are also links to the Adult Bible Study Guide so you can follow along. Sharing is easy. Just click share and choose your favorite social media. Share a link. Save a life for eternity. Hello, friends. Welcome back to 3ABN Sabbath School panel. We're going to pass it on to Pastor John Dinsey for Tuesday's lesson. Thank you very much. You know, the title for this lesson is in the form of a question. It's time to simplify. And I'd like to read the opening paragraph of this lesson. 
that is there. Uh, it says, what should Seventh-day Adventist Christians do in response to difficult times? Do we hunker down in survival mode? No. In fact, just the opposite is true because we know that the end of the world and the second coming of Christ is near. And we want to use our assets to tell others the good news of the gospel and what God has prepared for those who love Him. Also, we understand that someday soon everything on earth will be burned up. And this is why we go to 2 Peter chapter 3, beginning in verse 3. Notice verse 3. Knowing this first, that scoffers will come in the last days, mm -hmm. walking according to their own lusts. I'll stop there for a moment because the way they express themselves it's uh, apparently they hear the, the gospel or were part of those that believe in the gospel. But now notice how they are talking and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. These apparently are believers because they're mentioning creation. And notice that they are not walking according to the ways of the Lord. They're not walking in the light as God is in the light. They're walking in darkness because it says they are walking according to their own lusts. They are living like the world, no interest in godly things. And they also have the opportunity for salvation, but they are paying attention more to the things of the world. You know, in Matthew chapter 24, verse 44, we are told, Therefore you also be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. You know, we hear these verses and sometimes we kind of dismiss them. Oh yes, the Lord will come as a thief in the night. I understand that. But we are supposed to be ready. And the unbelievers don't know when Jesus is coming. And the believers do not know when Jesus is coming. We do not know. We are told to watch and be ready. We now move to verse 5. It says, for the scoffers, for they, this they willfully forget. They make a decision. This they willfully forget that by the word of God, the heavens were of old and the earth standing out of the water and in the water, by which the world that then existed perished being flooded with water, but the heavens and the earth which are now preserved, but the heavens and the earth which are now preserved by the same word are reserved for fire unto, until the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. In the time of Noah, he preached for about 120 years. And interestingly enough, the people of Noah's day even saw the animals going into the ark. It was not something they had ever seen in their lives, but even this did not awaken them to the reality that the flood was coming. Did they know when the flood was coming? No. Likewise, we do not know when the Lord is coming. But like they were told to get ready and get into the ark, we are told to be ready for when the Lord comes. They had an opportunity to get into the ark and some people put these things off they waited till the last moment, and of course, it was too late because the door was shut. Likewise, we are living in the time of the end. The time will come when the Lord will pronounce that which is found in Revelation chapter 22 that says, He that is unjust, let him be unjust still. He that is filthy, let him be filthy still. And he that is righteous, let him be righteous still. So the time is coming when the time of opportunity that we call the close of probation will come and then no one else will be able to accept Jesus Christ. And the reality of this is as well is that God has done the work through his children, preaching the gospel to the whole world. And people like the scoffers take the position, where's the promise of his coming? They do not see the signs because uh, the signs are occurring. They're taking place, but they do not pay attention to these signs. They take place and they go on walking after their lusts. But we know, as, as we just read, that these things that we see, they are reserved for fire until the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. Verse 8, but beloved, do not forget this one thing, that, that with the Lord one day is a, as a thousand years and a thousand years as a day. 
beautiful to understand is that the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, but as some count slackness, it says, but is long suffering. He is patient with us, long suffering, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. All can come to repentance, but not all come to repentance. Mm -hmm. yeah. They all have the opportunity, but they do not take advantage of the opportunity. And uh, I am glad and praise the Lord that the door of mercy is still open today. And I encourage you that if you're not walking in the light as God is in the light, it's time to ask yourself, what am I doing? Where is this going to take me? Is it going to take me to salvation or destruction so that I will be burned up with the earth when it is burnt up? It's time to ask yourself, what should I be doing? I encourage you to give yourself to the Lord and be ready. Take part in spreading the gospel. Use your means to spread the gospel. Let's continue in verse 12. Looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be dissolved, being on fire, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. This is a question. Now, notice the thought of this is in the first part, looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God. You know, we are told in Matthew 24, verse 14, that this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then the end shall come. We can participate in that. And it appears to say here that we can take part and bring in that day a little quicker. That wouldn't that be wonderful? You know, uh, some people think it has... Uh, it, has, uh, it should have taken a long place a long time ago, but we have the opportunity today. And we, let's take the opportunity, do what you can while you can with what you have. And so I take you now to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, and we're going to look at verse 2 uh, through 4. For you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night. For when they say peace, and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them as labor pains upon a pregnant woman, and they shall not escape. There will be no escape. Mm -hmm. The only solution is Jesus Christ. Yes. But look at verse 4. But you, brethren, are not in darkness, so that this day should overtake you as a thief. Praise the Lord. Those that are following the Lord and walking in the light, they are not going to be surprised. They are going to be glad. Mm -hmm. This is the day we waited for, and the Lord has come to save us. Amen. Praise the Lord. So uh, even though we do not know the day or the hour, by watching and prayer, we will be ready. Be ye also ready. For as, a, as such a time you think not, the Lord is coming. Uh, now, concerning the things that we possess, the lesson brings this out. We understand from the Word of God that He's not sending moving vans to take our stuff to heaven. I thought that was kind of interesting the way He put it. He's not sending moving, van, moving vans to take your possessions. Don't get tied up with your possessions. Don't take deep roots in this world because this world is not our final home. It says here, it will all get burned up in the final conflagration when all traces of sin and evil except the scars on Christ's hands mm -hmm. will be forever destroyed. The only remaining thing of this world will be the scars on the hands of Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. What a reminder wow. of the horrible things yes. that sin has caused and the suffering mm -hmm. that sin has caused. I read to you from the lesson, and it is quoting Ellen uh, uh, G. White, Councils on Stewardship. So what should we do with our possessions? It is, now, it is now that our brethren should be cutting down their possessions instead of increasing them. We are about to move to a better country, even a heavenly. Then let us not be uh, dwellers upon the earth, but, be getting, but, but getting things in, into as compact as, com as compass as possible. Compact as a compass as possible. Let's get things uh, reduced, in other words. And, you know, it's interesting because we do not know. Uh, some people want to reserve things. I think I'll, I will uh, do something for the Lord later. Do what you can with the, uh, for the Lord now. Yeah. This is the time we have. We're not promised tomorrow. Do what you can for the Lord today. And 
watch and be ready for such a time as you think not, the Lord is coming. Amen and amen. You know, the wonderful lesson, Ryan, Jill, Johnny. My, I'm Shelley Quinn and my lesson is Wednesday. It is priorities. I have a habit of um, journaling my prayers in the morning. I sit at my computer and it's just like I'm writing a letter to the Lord. And what happens is this keeps me really focused. What I have found, however, is some mornings you get up, you hit the floor running, you're running a little late, there's getting phone calls coming in and texts, there's things that need to be done. And you know what? If I don't make God my first priority, sometimes I find that it's clear to the end of the evening that I'm giving Him leftovers. The Bible is clear. God wants our total commitment. He wants total devotion. When Jesus was asked, what is the most important commandment in Mark 12, 30, he said, this is it. You should love the Lord your God with all of your heart, your mind, your soul, and your strength. You know, it's easy to say, oh, I love you, Lord. But if you're not putting any strength, any oomph in behind it, love is shown by actions. So, I will submit to you, I believe it is only possible as all obedience is made, is we are empowered by the Holy Spirit. God pours His love into our hearts. But God's not interested in just leftovers of our time or our money. Listen to this, Revelation 3.15. These are the words of our Savior. And He is saying to this church of Laodicea, I know your works. You're neither hot, cold nor hot. I wish you were cold or hot. So then because you are lukewarm, neither cold nor hot. Ooh, this one's hard. I will vomit you out of my mouth because you say I am rich. I have become wealthy. I have need of nothing, and, I, and you do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. There is no half-hearted commitment to Jesus. Of course, you know that this goes on in verse 20, and he says, hey, I stand at the door and knock, and if you'll open the door, I'll come in and sup with you. He wants to fellowship with us, but how many of us, even churches, is Jesus on the outside. We've become a little social club and he's on the outside saying, let me in, let me in. So there's no partial obedience, no half-hearted commitment, no such thing as a carnal Christian. You cannot have one foot in the kingdom and one in the world. James 1.18 says that a double-minded man is unstable in all that he does. Mm -hmm. So there's no neutral position. You're either on the side of Christ or guess what? If you're not on Christ's side, you're on the side of Satan. Jesus mm -hmm. said in Luke 11:23, he who is not with me, mm -hmm. that's siding and believing with me, working with me is against me. And he who does not gather with me, engage in the interest of trying to save others and gathering with him scatters. Mm -hmm. Ooh. So you can't be neutral. If you're neutral, you're scattering. First John 3, 7, if you know me at all, you know that righteousness by faith is one of my favorite topics because it is the everlasting covenant. But listen to what John writes. He says, little children, first John, 3, 7. Let no one deceive you. He who practices righteousness is righteous just as he, Jesus, is righteous. Mm -hmm. He who sins is of the devil. Let me tell you, Jesus didn't die for you so that you could live like the devil. Mm -hmm. He died for you right. that you might become the righteousness of God in Christ yeah. Jesus. Oh, yeah. And he says, he who sins is of the devil for the devil sinned from the beginning. And for this purpose, the son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. One of my favorite scriptures, Psalm 85, 13. It says, righteousness will go before him and shall make his 
footsteps our pathway. That's what John goes on in 1 John mm -hmm. 2, 6. He said, whoever says that he abides in him, and if you're not abiding in Jesus, you're not saved. Mm -hmm. You've got to be connected to the vine. Right. But he who says he abides in him, John says, you ought to be walking just as he walked. How do we walk as Jesus walked? When you are in Christ, we are given the Holy Spirit. And when the Spirit is in us, Jesus is more than our Savior. He is our master. Who is your master? The Bible says we're either slaves of sin or slaves of obedience. Let me read that. Romans 6.16. 6, do you not know that to whom you present yourself slaves to obey, you are that one slaves whom you obey, whether of sin leading to death, that's the second death, utter destruction, or of obedience, that's obedience motivated by love that leads us, the scripture says, to righteousness. It's leading us in the path that Jesus walked. Jesus said in Matthew 6, 24, no one can serve two masters. Mm -hmm. For either he will hate the one, that means he will love them less, be less devoted to, or kind of disregard the one, and love the other, or he will stand by and be devoted to the one and despise and be against the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. What is mammon? Mammon is deceitful riches, money, possessions, or whatever you're putting your trust in. Mammon for David was numbering the people. He was putting his trust in the numbers. But this is interesting. Jesus here, when he says you can't serve two masters, he's picturing us as slaves under the control of a master, either of God or of deceitful materialism. Sometimes if we are slaves of materialism, that has a higher priority commitment in our life is to gather things. And it's so funny. You spend all your young years, and I'm not saying, we all gather things. I like my stuff. We spend our young years gathering our stuff, and then guess what? You get to a certain age and you start trying to think, now where do I, how do I dish out this stuff? Because I'm not going to be able to take it with me. So today's Society is so materialistic that there are so many who are lusting after the things of the world and mm. they are making that, they're spending all of their time working on that. It is their top priority only to die and leave it behind, as I said. Now, uh, this quarterly says this. Notice that Jesus didn't say that it was hard to serve money and God, God and money or that you needed to be careful in you and how you serve both. Jesus said instead that it couldn't be done. Mm -hmm. Period. Mm -hmm. The end. Why? The love of the money, 1 Timothy 6.10 tells us, is the root of all evil. There's nothing wrong with money, and God actually gives us the increase so that we will have plenty of seed to sow for Him. Okay. But who is your master? Here's how you tell. Who's occupying your thoughts? What's occupying your thoughts? Mm -hmm. What's occupying your time and your efforts? Are we storing up treasures on earth or in heaven? 1 John 2, 15. Through 17. I'm going to read it from the Amplified very quickly. Do not love or cherish the world or the things that are in the world. If anyone loves the world, love for the Father's not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, that's craving for sensual gratification, the lust of the eyes, greedy longings of the mind, and the pride of life. You know what I think of a pride of life? That's when you're parading your possessions around like a peacock. You know, <laughs> on the farm, we used to see the peacocks and they'd and they just parade around. That's what some people do because they're so proud of what they've attained. Mm -hmm. The whole point is this. The world is going to be burned up, mm -hmm. as you said. Right. Mm -hmm. We have to understand there's no middle ground. Our devotion 
should be marked by love and obedience to God first or else we're actually in rebellion against God. So the pride of life, the lust of the flesh is not what God wants. What he wants is genuine love relationship with you. What he wants is sincerity and a generous spirit and humility of services. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Shelley, for, for the way you connected that to righteous living, not just the topic in and of itself, but righteous living, which makes a major difference when it comes to managing through tough times. Your spiritual condition is often more important than your materialistic possession. Mine is entitled, One No One Can Buy or Sell, which, which gives us an opportunity to dive in Revelation. Let's go to Revelation chapter 13. There is a time that's not too far distant because we are living in Revelation chapter 13 already. We're living between the first and second beast of Revelation chapter 13, between the risen kingdom of Rome and the apostate system of Protestantism, which has metamorphosized into something that God never intended. A movement that began in the Protestant Reformation as going back to the Bible has all but abandoned the Bible on so many points. And what people believe nowadays, and I like the way you said it, is motivated by preference, ideology, what I've heard, what I desire. And religion to today is just that, religion, very few things that are connected to Christ. One person once said, if the Spirit of God was withdrawn from the earth, much of what is happening in the church will continue. That's why Revelation's message is, behold, I stand at the door and knock. Mm -hmm. Could you let me in? I know you guys are righteously uh, focusing on your own things and your own ideologies. Isaiah 4, verse 1. In that day, seven women will take hold of one man, saying, we will eat our own bread, wear our own apparel, only let us be called by your name to take away our reproach. That's the day and age in which we live. And so when Revelation 13 brings a focus about how this is going to nosedive, how the economic, social, spiritual, and, and societal aspects, religious aspects of society are going to nosedive, it gives us the context in which these changes are going to be affected. Revelation 13, verse 11 to 17. Then I saw another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb and spoke like a dragon. That's none other than the United States, coming up at a time when the powers of Europe were descending, when Rome was about to receive a deadly wound, God was bringing up this lamb-like nation. Why lamb? That's the symbol of Christ. A very infant nation, also the symbol of the lamb, but it had two horns. What were those horns? A government that was a republic by the people for the people and a system of religion that was Protestant, antithetical to all that Rome had endorsed. It was not a top-down system, but a bottom-up and the people had the freedom of religion. This is vitally important. That's what's, if you think about it nowadays, America is not a nation that really focuses on freedom of religion. It's imposing a certain brand of religion mm -hmm. on its yeah. society. Be careful when you start voting, and I'm gonna be very candid with you. When you start voting because somebody agrees with you uh, uh, doctrinally, that's not what the Bible ever forced. Jesus in his day never insisted on pushing political issues. Even when he was, even when they said to him, aren't you gonna restore Israel at this time? Even when they came up against the issues in Rome, the Lord never dove into political issues. But the church today has done more than that. It has become, it is the desire of religious leaders to control political issues. And that's why Revelation 13 is gonna be an easy segue from the control of religion to the control of merchants in America. Look at this. It says here in verse uh, 12, and he exercised all the authority of the first beast before him or in his presence. And look at the impact and cause the earth and those who dwell in it to worship the first beast. That is America, when they make an image to the beast, that's America when they now begin to reach across the Gulf and unite with the powers of Rome, there will be an economic embargo on the citizens of the world. We'll see that in the verses following. And it says in verse 13, and he performs great signs so that he even makes fire come down from heaven on earth on the side of men. And he deceives those who dwell on the earth by the means of those signs which he was granted to do in the sight of the beast, telling those who dwell on the earth to make an image to the beast who was wounded by the sword and lived. So much that, that could be unpacked here. But notice this, verse 15, he was granted power to give breath to the image of the beast or life that the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast to be killed. He caused all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond or slave, 
to receive a mark on their right hand or on their foreheads. And here's the impact. And that no one may buy or sell except one has the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. So you don't even have to have the mark. You could have the name of the beast or the number of his name. Allegiance on any platform disqualifies you from being under God's blessing. For those who have possessions, and I like the way you lay the foundation, all of you, when your possessions become your focus, when this economic embargo is imposed, people will think more about sustaining their way of life mm -hmm. than their way of worship, than true worship. That's why John 4, verse 23 and 24 says, the hour is coming in which the true worshiper must worship the Father in spirit and in truth. It's not about worship, it's about true worship because worship, there are economic reasons behind a lot of worship today. They wanna be able to live the fat life and unfortunately, God's name is often used to sustain a kind of life that is antithetical to the humility that Jesus is connected to. So not being able to buy or sell means <clears throat> when that time comes, you'll not be able to function in a society where you have to have allegiance to a power that's antithetical to Christ in order to sustain the way you live. So the question is asked, how do financial matters today fit into the time of persecution? How dependent are you today on the systems of the world to survive? That's a big question. Let me make it very practical. Are you in debt? Are you in serious debt? Because some people carry some level of debt, but if you cannot breathe, without leaning on the system, if your credit is so, if your sustenance of life is so dependent on all that society provides for you, then you are living a fragile, almost like a vanilla wafer life. Just a little bit of moisture in your life falls apart. You have to make sure that you are being sustained by God because when these systems impose themselves, look at Revelation 18 verse three, it's a worldwide impact. Yes. For all nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of a fornication. That's not only that, not only the society and the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her. That's the political leaders and the merchants of the earth have become rich through the abundance of her luxuries. This powerful head under the leadership of Rome has an impact socially, religiously and economically. And the entire world, as Jeremiah says, the nations are deranged because they have drunk of the wine of Babylon. And today people are looking at, what's the, what's the slogans in America? Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Everybody wants to be happy. And we tend to mean that happiness is, I got new toys, I have a lot of things that I'm living for. If you're not living for Christ, and let me say this, hold onto the world ever so lightly, but hold onto Jesus ever so tightly. That's good. So here are my takeaways. I use the word takeaways, Jill. <laughs> First thing I suggest you do, invest in God invest in God. Matthew 6, verse 19 and 20. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break into steal. Translated, invest in the things that will advance the gospel. Invest in those things that will make a difference in eternity. Another soul, another life for the kingdom. If your finance is not given towards where somebody can know more about Christ, if your finance is not used to win another soul for the kingdom, it's frivolous. Mm -hmm. It has no eternal value. The second thing is do not place your well-being in man. Psalm 146 verse three, do not put your trust in princes nor in the son of man in whom there is no help. You know, when the credit card companies decide they're not taking your payments any longer and they're gonna possess your property and there's debtor prisons again, like they used to be in Bible times, you will have all that you have will all of a sudden lose its impress upon you. It'll no longer be important. You'll be willing to give it all up just to be free. So put not your trust in men or in those things they provide. Number three, know that God will protect you. Psalm 91 verse three, when this time comes, surely he shall deliver you from the sneer of the fowler and from the perilous pestilence. He shall cover you with his feathers and under his wings you shall take refuge. His truth shall be your shield and defense. You shall not be afraid of the terror by night nor of the arrow that flies by day. Yes, this time of economic embargo is coming and it's gonna be terrible before it gets better permanently. But if you trust in God, if you lean upon him, he will sustain you, which is point number four. Uh, disconnect from uh, 
your dependence on man's system. Proverbs 22, verse 7, the rule rich is over the poor, the rich rule over the poor, and the borrower is the servant of the lender. And finally, re recognize that God will provide all of your need. Psalm 50 and verse 12, if I were hungry, I would not tell you, for the world is mine in all of its fullness. And so here's the key. What's the system that God put in place? Let's go back to the very foundation of this lesson, stewardship. If you are faithful in your tithe and offerings to God, you are laying up treasure in heaven. If you are investing to ministries that are winning souls for Christ, you are faithful to God who will sustain you in difficult times. He will dwell on high. His place and his defense will be in the Lord. Trust God. And when difficult times come, God will bring you through it. Amen. Mm, amen. Praise the Lord. May God have mercy on us all when we get to those times because we're going to need to make sure that we are locked in on Jesus Christ and only serving Him. Let's get some final thoughts from our panel members. On Monday's lesson, we looked at David numbering Israel. And you know, he didn't set out for 70,000 men to die. He didn't set out to walk in disobedience to God. I think it was a lot of fear. Not sure. Can I trust God? And so just make a choice to trust God with your life. Amen. In Tuesday's lesson, we talked about time to simplify, and we have to ask ourselves, is there anything that is hindering me from walking closer with the Lord? We should live with our focus in heaven and salvation. So continue following the Lord Jesus Christ with heaven as a focus. Priorities, Jesus said, seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. Everything else will be added to you. Daniel 12, 1, a time of trouble is coming, but when you trust God, here's your assurance. At that time, his people shall be delivered. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Well, my friends, we have come to the end of lesson number 11. And, you know, as we have clearly studied today, especially from Pastor Loma King's lesson, uh, it just brought me back to the seriousness of living for Christ and being fully surrendered because these things are coming before us. They are unfolding before our eyes. We should choose this day whom we shall serve. That's our choice today. If you want to join us next week because we're going to be diving into the very last lesson of this quarter. And it is entitled Rewards of the Faithfulness. And so be sure to join us back here next week. Tell your friends about us. Tell your friends about us. Send the link and we will see you right back here next week. God bless.